So hi folks, um, it's Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatorio channel, and I'm here in St Mary's Church in Dennington in Suffolk in England with Dr T Tobias Capwell from the Wallace Collection. And we're here to talk about effigies, uh, and we might talk a little bit about brasses as well. And if you're wondering what's an effigy, what's a brass, we're going to explain that uh, in this video. So what we have here is a 15th century knightly effigy. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about this, just as an introduction, and then we can talk a bit more about effigies in general? Sure, yeah. Effigies are, are, are one of these art forms that were hugely important in the Middle Ages and all the way through the Renaissance, and actually right through into the modern into the modern world, but they're the sort of thing that because they've been around in our everyday lives for, for people who live in England and, and are used to going into churches, they're just kind of, they become part of the landscape. And for that reason, they've, they've kind of been taken for granted. They've been misunderstood. We get used to seeing them, so we don't look at them so much. And it's kind of easy to forget for the, that reason that Churches in England, uh, and throughout the British Isles really, are really important, major repositories for extraordinary works of medieval and Renaissance art that you know, most national museums would be very pleased to have in their, in their galleries. And they're just sort of scattered around the country. So, like, if anybody out there is thinking, so why, do, what are these statues? That it looks like a statue lying on its back, and it's uh, that's what we call an effigy. And this obviously is what most of you would think of as a knight. It's someone in armour, um, and this is from the what about the 1430s, 1440s. Um, so, why were they there? What do they represent? That's a really good question, and the answer to that question leads you all kinds of, uh, down all kinds of interesting paths. Uh, but the answer is, is not as obvious or straightforward as, as we might think. Um, an effigy, technically, of course, is any representation of the human form. So effigies get burnt at political demonstrations and, <laughs> and on Guy Fawkes night and this kind of thing. And technically a brass, a two-dimensional brass, is a form of effigy. Uh, this is what, you know, we, if we wanted to be specific, uh, we would call a high relief effigy um, because it's a, it's a sculpted three-dimensional representation. And I guess most of us tend to assume, uh, you know, you could look at this and assume that this is a kind of like a, a really glorified tombstone and that it, its main purpose is as a, a statement for eternity, you know, a sign of this person's existence, who they were, uh, when they lived, you know, how they wish to be remembered. And, and effigies certainly do have that function, uh, even if it's kind of incidental, but that is not their primary reason for being. Um, they also have a kind of, um, uh, architectural effect, where if um, succession, successive generations of the same medieval knightly family all set up their monuments in a particular church that has a particular significance, then they start to kind of take over the church. And there are, there are many churches in England where you walk into them and if they are there are churches that are associated with a castle or that once were associated with a manor residence. Um, you walk in there and you've got knights from the 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th century. They're all there. The whole church has been transformed into a mausoleum, a statement of dynasty for that particular family. Mm -hmm. So there's that effect as well, that kind of long-term assertion of noble rights over a particular area, the dominion over, over land. Um, but that's not what effigies are for either, really. We're talking about very powerful kind of secondary effects. Um, the real function of these things, the most important function, cuts right to the heart of medieval Christian belief. And you've got to understand a couple of things about that before you can understand this. Um, first, the medieval, the medieval Christian concept of death. 
uh, that at death, uh, depending on the state of your soul, uh, some people, some very bad people, go straight to hell. Right? They just go straight to hell. Most people are not like that, though. Most people have, most souls have some chance of redemption. There's also those few people, those saintly monks and, and so forth, who go straight to heaven. But there's not many of those either. Most people in the medieval belief, their souls at death would move to purgatory. And purgatory is this kind of empty void, this kind of nothing realm, where a sort of shadowy place where a soul must exist in, a, in I guess, a state of intense boredom uh, <laughs> for potentially thousands of years. So in this medieval belief system, this person, the soul of this person, might still be in purgatory now. Um, and it's this stay in purgatory that uh, eventually will lead to the soul moving to heaven when it is uh, appropriate. So that's, that's the basic model that we're dealing with. That's what these people believe. Um, now, they also believe, and this is critical, they also believe that the living can exert an influence on the movement of the soul from purgatory finally to heaven. And the prayers of the living can speed the journey of the soul through purgatory. Right? This is called intercessionary prayer, the intercession of the living on behalf of the dead. Okay? So the more people that are praying for your soul and the more active prayers are offered, uh, the more time is kind of cut off of your stay in purgatory. <laughs> um, and, and, and those prayers can cut your stay in purgatory by hundreds of years. And this, this, you gotta, gotta get this sense that this is a literal belief. People believe this literally just as much as they believe in the world that they experience when they're alive. It's just as real to them. Mm. So in life, rich people like Lord Bardolph here would pay huge, huge, huge amounts of money to set up a system for intercessionary prayer after death. So the effigy is part of that. The whole space in which we're standing right now is a Chantry Chapel. Chantry Chapels are places dedicated to nothing except uh, intercessionary prayer. They are engines. Chanting. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. They're engines for intercession. So this whole space was created specifically for the benefit of the souls of these two people. And they've put a monetary investment into, into this. So this is an art form, and this, uh, this, is, this is an art form that will literally save your soul. <laughs> because the effigy is one of the critical determining factors in whether those intercessionary prayers work. The, the idea is that in an intercessionary prayer, you need to have a, a kind of meditative image of the person you're praying for in your mind. And the, the more tangible that sense of the person is, the more lifelike the effigy is in conjuring that image, the more effective those prayers are going to be. Mm. Uh, and it's, it's almost like, not to get, you know, too literal about it, but it's almost like the effigy is a kind of address for those intercessionary prayers. Because there's millions of souls in purgatory, and, and there's always a question of whether those prayers are really going to get to where they need to be. Um, so that's what the effigy is really about. So it's if about the, the ultimate, you know, state of your soul through yeah. eternity. So if that's the, the sort of the motivation for making these brasses and effigies, these images of, of these, uh, the great and the good, to help them get through purgatory and get to heaven, why, and this is why we're here in a way, why are they in armour? Yeah, well not all <laughs> effigies are. No. I mean, effigies are about representing as accurately and as evocatively as possible 
the identity of this person. Who was this person when they were alive? What were their physical attributes? What was their status, their identity, and how can that best be, be represented visually? Hmm. And this person was a knight. He was a warrior. Uh, he was a, an administrator, a local landowner. Actually, by the time he died, he owned something like, or he was in control of 10 counties across England. So he's actually quite a powerful lord with close royal associations. But he's a knight. He's a warrior. He fought at the Battle of Agincourt. He fought throughout Henry V's 1417 campaign. He was fighting in Normandy all the way through until Henry V's death. Yeah. Uh, and even after that, in the reign of the, the child king, Henry VI, he was given the special privilege of being the leader of eight knights and squires, eight men-at-arms, who were assigned to guard the king's person at all times. So he was like the, the immediate lifeguard of the young king, Henry VI. So that's an extraordinarily prestigious mm. warrior position. And the effort, and, and you know, armor, armor is what tells you that. You see armor, you think knight. Mm. I mean, not all effigies represent knights, but they usually represent not people of the, the knightly classes. Mm. Esquires, high-ranking common man-at-arms or, or knights. And, and usually an effigy will show you very clearly where in that knightly hierarchy the individual belongs. So you look at this one. He's covered, he's got the, the, the knightly girdle covered in, in gilded uh, applications. He's got gilded decoration all over his armor. He has the, the, uh, the livery collar of the Lancastrian mm -hmm. uh, house. You know, there's all kinds of things that tell you yeah. in the knightly scheme of things, he's pretty high up. You don't need to be literate yeah. to, to know who this person is. So we're going to talk more in depth about this individual in the next video. but. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it's important to state for anybody who doesn't already know this that there are effigies and brasses of civilians, of people in civilian clothes and in, in, in everyday clothing as they wanted to be represented. And clergy. Uh, clergy and, and, yeah, and abbots and, mm -hmm. and high clergy as well and, and, um, and merchants and all sorts. So whereas a certain proportion of the people who had these monuments built for themselves or their family had them built for them, wanted to be perceived and seen and remembered and identified as primarily, even if they did other things, mm -hmm. even if they were also merchants or also uh, landowners or farmers, they wanted to be identified primarily as this sort of yeah. soldier yeah. Um, with the military. And this is, you know, this connects to the wearing of swords in later periods as mm -hmm. well. If we go to the 18th century, the wearing of the small sword as designating a gentleman and things like this. So. It's very complex, isn't it? All of these different things at play with what can on the surface seem like just, you know, a statue of a, of a dead person. Mm. It's, it's so complex how many things are wrapped up in, yeah. in, these, uh, in these tombs, essentially. And, and this, is, this, is a, this is about medieval people telling you, individual to individual, who they were and how they want to be remembered and what they believed and what was important to them. So a lot of any sort of historical interest or inquiry is about getting your head around who these people were and mm. get and really getting a sense for yourself that history is about people just like me. Mm. It's not some abstract story uh, happening beyond oneself. It's, you know, it, it should be a kind of empathic process. and. Effigies, I think, are one of the great ways that you really come into kind of personal contact, in a way, with, with medieval people. Yeah. And once you start to get a sense of that, whether you're interested in painting or sword fighting or horseshoes or, or whatever, if you have that sort of personal felt connection, you know, your, your, your study and your interest, I think, will be a lot more rewarding. So a few simple questions that um, many people might wonder. Is there a body underneath here? Is this over an actual tomb? No. 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 Uh, I'm not going to say that the bodies were never, ever, ever put in the, in the tomb chests, uh, because I don't know that for 100%, and that's an awfully big thing to say 
uh, on uh, on YouTube, but um, <laughs> uh, generally, no. In this in this particular case, we know from the the, the burial documentation that Lord Bardolph said. My monument will be in my Chantry Chapel. There will be a thousand masses said every day for, for my soul. My body will reside in the churchyard. He says that. Okay. The body goes somewhere else. Uh, sometimes they can, you know, they're generally, they're generally remote from, yeah. from the monument. The next question I think a lot of people might wonder is, do we know that they looked like the people they were representing? Mm -hmm. That's a big question. And it's a hard one to be sure about a lot of the time. Um, the, uh, I think one of the other critical things to, to kind of get your head around in thinking about effigies is to understand that, that the commissioning and creation of an effigy was a tremendously variable process. You know, you look at when we have good documented examples, we see that it could happen in a lot of different ways, depending on the circumstances of death, how much preparation had been done before death, what had to be done afterwards, were the executors in a financial position to execute the wishes as they were intended to be, were there other factors that meant they couldn't get it done and it didn't happen for 20 years. You know, from effigy to effigy, you can have radically different stories of, of how the thing got made. Mm -hmm. And different supervisors, the, whether it's the patron himself, the, 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 the subject himself creating the effigy before death, paying for it before death, or whether it's an executor doing it on his behalf after mm -hmm. death, the, the process uh, and the work of the artist could vary a lot. In some cases, the artist had met the person he was going to be representing. He had access to the person's equipment. He was supplied with very detailed instructions of every little detail. And other times, the person died and was buried in France, and it was five years before they set the effigy up. And, you know, the artist probably didn't have the same kind of references from, from, from example to example. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, yes, I think sometimes they are the real armors or parts of the real armor that actually belong to this person. Sometimes the, the faces are portraits, uh, but sometimes they're not. And, and the difficulty, one of the pitfalls of effigy study traditionally has always been that effigies have been looked at as individuals on an individual basis. So someone has looked at one effigy and said, well, that obviously is an idealized face. That's yeah. obviously not a portrait. Therefore, effigies are not portraits. Mm. But if you look at 230 of them, and you know that for every idealized one, there's a couple that are wrinkly and balding and not very nice looking, um, <laughs> you know, you realize how variable it is. And, and the answer is yes, mm. sometimes yes, and sometimes no. So a question, uh, another question that's related, very closely related to that, and it's essentially the same question. A lot of people, when they're looking in books about armour, be it your, your own book or, or other books that, that have come out over the last 50 years, will say, does that armour represent what that person wore in life mm -hmm. or what they had at death? Because mm -hmm. obviously, you know, mm -hmm. this, this person who we'll talk about later um, served for a long period of time. So, you know, he was at the Battle of Agincourt, yeah. for example, but this isn't the armour no. he would have been wearing he then. He didn't have this yet. Exactly. This is, this is futuristic. At but we know that by studying yeah. arts and paintings, right. lots of other sources. Right. Um, so, again, I think people try to make a sweeping statement or sweeping assumption about, mm -hmm. oh, well, you know, we know that, let's say, the Black Prince's armour dates from mm -hmm. X date, so therefore all effigies or all brasses must show the armour of, you know, when they were alive or when they were young or when they were, you mm -hmm. know, on their deathbed. Mm -hmm. um, and as you've said, I think we can't always assume. Uh, we have to draw on other sources, yeah. be it yeah. specific to that effigy or our knowledge of armour from other, yeah. from other I mean, sources. It, it's clear that armour develops very rapidly and you can date it quite specifically. Mm. And you know, what I've tried to do is take in a, a huge variety of different sources of different representations and of course the real armor itself and try to build up a framework for dating 
based on as many different datable reference points created for as many different reasons as possible. Mm -hmm. And once you've done that and you go back and look at the effigies, it seems almost invariably that the effigy's armor dates from the time of the effigy's creation. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the carvers almost never, uh, except in very unusual situations, uh, they almost never try and backdate. Mm -hmm. You know, Sir Richard Beecham died in, the, in 1438. His effigy wasn't made until 1450. The, the, the effigy, make, the, the sculptor in 1450 did not try and go back and show 1438. No. He shows the up-to-date, high-tech armor of his Milanese own time. Kind of, yeah. and, and one of the reasons for that, I think, is because, again, taking account of the effigy's function as a kind of spur for intercessionary prayer, as, as one noted um, monument scholar has, has termed it, um, the, uh, the realism is what's important. And if you're going to get greater realism by showing the armor of your own time that you as a craftsman are familiar with, you as a craftsman have armor in your workshop that you use as references, they, your customers are supplying you with kit to be used as references, you know, these are works very much of their own moment. Mm. And, and, and in all cases where you see that someone commissioned a monument, had it made in 1440, but they didn't end up dying until 1470, you know, the, the monument is of the time in which it was made. Yeah. So the last question, I think, um, to wrap up with, would, and it's a question that comes up a lot, is how much do you think effigies and brasses actually show real armors mm -hmm. or imagined armors or perhaps one set of armor being used across a series of effigies. Mm -hmm. What are mm -hmm. your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, the, the first thing is that we, we often kind of lump effigies and brasses together as a group. And I, that kind of makes sense because they, they're doing the same thing. You know, a brass is, a ch is in generally a cheaper version of this. Uh, 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 and, and sometimes a brass can more easily be fitted into the architecture of an old church. You need a lot more room to set something like this up and they're not always available. So, but you really need to think about, from our purposes, interested in arms and armor and fighting and things, that you gotta think of the effigies as, as really a separate consideration from the brasses. Uh, it's a totally different art form with different limitations, different advantages. Mm. Um, but they, they are both art forms where the creators are very, very uh, concerned with technical detail and creating a sense of, of technical and stylistic accuracy. They're all aware that an armor is inextricable from the identity of that person. The armor is what they wore when they served Edward III in the wars in France. The, the armor is what they were clad in when they fought at Agincourt. The armor is the cladding of their prowess and their honor and, and everything that's most important to them. So it's got to be done well. And sometimes the artist just didn't have the right helmet. <laughs> so he had to do his best with what he knew about armor. Mm. I mean, there are, there are examples of effigies where you look at it and you think, he had most of an armor to work from, but for some reason he didn't have the shoulders, and the shoulders look kind of funny, mm. and he hasn't nailed them quite right. He clearly didn't have that bit in front of him at the time. Um, it's very patchy, mm. but, they, but the point is they are concerned. They do their best. And sometimes the brasses uh, show important technical innovations that don't show up immediately on the effigies. You know, sometimes, you know, the, the two-dimensional brass uh, incisors, because they're working in a two-dimensional medium, they're sensitive to different kinds of details. Different kinds of armor details work better for their medium than this medium. Mm. Um, uh, so, you know, you have to look at them within their own context, but there's a tremendous amount of valuable information in them. And the other thing I would say is do not make too much of the old ideas about patterns. You know, there's a lot of stuff in the old literature about effigies and brasses being stock 
generic patterns like mm -hmm. as if you know so, you know someone walks into an effigy carver's workshop and says give me a number three body with a number <laughs> five head you know it doesn't work like that no. and, and even the brasses don't work like that you know brass even brasses are more individual than you are led to expect generally and certainly these i looked at 230 plus armored effigies dating from the 15th century in the course of all of this research that I'm still trying to finish publishing. And, uh, you know, there are groups of armors and groups of effigies that look similar because they're made at the same time. They're part of the same context. But none of these are the same. There is no evidence when you take all of the examples and put them in a pile and sort them out and look at them. There's no evidence of patterns at all. Mm. They're all different. They show different armors worn in slightly different ways different with different personal preferences. Yeah. You know, most of the time they wear the sword belt over the girdle, mm. but there's one guy up in Yorkshire who wears it under the girdle. And that kind of makes sense in a way, because wearing swords is a whole nother issue for a different film. But, yeah. you know, these are all individuals and they show different armors. That's why I've been able to tell the whole story of English armor in the 15th century because yeah. they are so varied. If they were stock patterns, I wouldn't have anything to say. Well, that's great. And I think that's a good note to wrap up on as well. And I, the other thing which we'll, we'll cover in another video, of course, is that a lot of the um, similarities between the effigies are down to similarities between the armors as well. Right, exactly. Uh, and, you know, exactly. some of these armors may have been made by the same armorer or the same workshop. Right. Um, and right. certainly with this is a characteristically English armor. Mm -hmm. There probably weren't that great a number of armorers working in England in the right. 1430s. So. Right. Um, but yeah, anyway, so we'll wrap up this video um, and in our next video we're going to be talking specifically about this effigy and the man that it represents. Cheers folks, thank you. See ya. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, follow us on Facebook. You can buy t shirts through Spreadshirt, support us on Patreon, or follow us on Pinterest. Thank you.